the best and the worst of 90s teen horror. I am Kirsty Logan and this is my co-host Heather Parry. Hello. Hi. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, a book that I have to say I have fallen a little bit in love with. Yeah. Um, we're talking about Twins by Caroline B. Cooney from 1994. Um, I should probably say I am overly interested in this book because I uh, am dating an identical twin. Mm -hmm. Is um, he the evil one or the not evil one? He's the evil one. <laughs> oh my god. But as we know, the sexier one is the evil one. That's true, that's mm -hmm. true. Although they have to die, but we'll go into that. We will. <laughs> um, I We've talked about one of Carolyn B. Cooney's books so far, and I am a little bit in love with her. I think she's really good. I think she's my favourite point horror writer so far. Me too. She's got a little bit of competition. Maybe we should keep a running tally of who we think mm. is good and not good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, She's definitely the top. I feel like her books, they're a different type of point horror. They kind of don't do the usual tropes. And I think they've often got a good feminist message. Mm -hmm. This one has it. Um, <laughs> At time. Kind of. A little bit. We'll get into it. Well, yeah, we will. We'll get way into it. Um, Kirsty, why don't you tell us about the cover? Okay, so I don't love this cover, I have to say. Um, it has got shiny silver writing that says twins. And it's got a portrait of a girl who, by the way, doesn't actually look like how she's <laughs> described in the book. Because she's described as having green eyes in the book and she's got brown eyes. But okay. She actually looks a bit like my friend uh, Gabriella Handal, who's a brilliant artist. Oh. Yes. Did she ever model in the 90s for Point Horror books? She does do a lot of self-portraits, so maybe she was... Maybe she's ageless. <laughs> and she was around in the 90s. This is her attic portrait. <laughs> I quite so, like the colour. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I think it's quite ugly. So, yeah, there's a portrait of a girl, and the portrait has smashed, and the glass is kind of leaping out at us, and the tagline is, Twice the Evil. Which I thought was a good tagline, but now having read the book, it's not at all. Um, no, it doesn't really suit the book. No, the mirror thing does come up, but I feel like it was a bit shoehorned into the story. Yeah. Maybe just to justify, to the, justify cover. the cover. <laughs> Although probably the cover came after, you would think. Maybe. I don't know. Who knows these days? Who knows? Anyway, so that's the cover and the tagline. Okay, let's get right into it. So, we meet our um, identical twin girls, Mary Lee and Madrigal. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of those names, Kirsty? I um, don't feel like the type of parent who would call a child Mary Lee would also call a child Madrigal. Yeah, I think Madrigal is actually a Colombian surname. Oh, is it? Which is quite... Mary Lee is very American, sort of... Merrily, yeah, like from a country song. Yeah, Midwest sort of, yeah, southerny sort of. I know they're two different places. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, it's very American. Yeah, whereas Madrigal, name. they say many times. Oh, did you know it's a it's a Renaissance song or like a some yeah, type, some of, type a of medieval? Thing? And you're like, why do they all know this? Yeah, it's not I common knowledge. I didn't know that. No, as a teenager. I don't even know that now. No, me no. I had to look it up as well. Yeah, <laughs> to clarify. <laughs> um, anyway, it's quite unusual, but I do like the name Madrigal. Yes. So um, our identical twins are going to be separated for the first time ever. You're saying this so calmly, but in the book, it is pure melodrama. There is there is not an understated emotion in this entire book <laughs> because it's twice the emotion. Well, that's it. true. It's like pure shrieking end-of-the-world drama, every single thing that happens. Because Mary Lee is very much not happy that she's going to be taken away from mm -hmm. her twin. They, um... Let's, let's describe them first. <laughs> okay. The girls have lovely olive skin, heavy black hair. Mm, heavy. Mm. <laughs> a weird way to describe that. And beautiful hazel eyes with their fringe of long lashes. 
they are echoes of each other, we're told. Mm -hmm. um, I have no problem believing this because my partner and his twin are completely identical. They do look very similar. To the extent that they have been confused for each other before, which is I always enjoy quite a lot. Do they, you confuse them ever? No. <laughs> Sorry, that was it. <laughs> what was that? I was just sick in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Although on the phone, yeah. Oh, okay. You can't you can't tell their voices apart. Which may be but that's quite common. I even sound like my mum on the phone and we don't look anything like each other. Do you? Yeah. They're just at the first hello. Your mum looks um like the identical twin of Judy Murray though. <laughs> Yes, so. that's true. That's true. She and can't... I look really nothing like Judy Murray. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll grow, you'll age into Judy Murray. Maybe. I, I mean, would love there's that. There's definitely worse things to age into. She's a fine looking woman. She's very good looking. Um, so, as we mentioned, uh, Mary Lee is going to be sent away to boarding school, whereas Madrigal is being kept at home to go to a new high school. No, I think the same school. No, I think it's, well, it's a new weird one. because at first she thinks they're going to keep her at the same school, and then later she realizes her parents said a weird thing, which was like, "We'll keep her at home under observation" or something. Mm. Which you're like, "Hmm, why did she do that?" So we already think maybe things aren't quite as Mary Lee thinks they are. Yeah, but Mary Lee believes that she's been sent away. Well, their parents tell them that they need to flourish as individual people, don't they? They say mm -hmm. that. It's being no good for them, sorry, it's no good for them to just grow up as uh, echoes of each other, if you will, because they're not developing as real people. Yeah. Which I think is fair enough. Yes, because they clearly have made some poor choices because she's like, but mother, because weirdly their parents don't have names, they're only ever called mother, mother and, and father. father. That's yes. weird, that's mm. really weird. I, oh, it's just very upper class as well. It's mother. mother. Father, father, will you bring the lapsang souchong? Don't people say m um, mother and daddy? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> I don't know that many ooh. posh people, but I feel like they say daddy. They don't say father. No, I don't. I'm not a fan of that. No, that's a bit creepy. But oh. I think that's what they do. Um, but yeah, so their parents have made mother and father have made some weird choices in that they've always dressed them identically and given them identical things, which I don't think is a great idea for identical twins. No, and it's kind of stupid because um, you can't tell which one is which when they're little. Yeah. So I know that David and James were always dressed in red or blue to very easily yeah. <laughs> to know which one of the twins they were because little kids all look the same. And when you've got identical kid twins, they just look identical. You can't they, tell yeah. them apart. And imagine if you switched them by accident. <laughs> And they would never know. Maybe that did yeah. happen when yeah. they were young. Oh, God. You would never know, would you? Babies are just squishy-faced, tiny humans. You can't yeah. tell one from another. And they don't have, probably don't have any kind of scars or marks or anything. Not at that age, no. No. Well, maybe that did happen. Oh, Who God. would know? Because you couldn't even tell, could you? It's the same DNA. Yeah. You can't even get a blood test or anything. Oh, Fingerprints yeah. are different, I think. Are they? They Actually, must maybe be. maybe they're not. They must be. I know DNA is the same. I don't know about fingerprints. But you would then... We don't have a fingerprint a baby anyway, are we? <laughs> it's my hobby. <laughs> I mean, they do fingerprint babies for Heather this battle. baby fingerprinter. <laughs> it's also the title of my new detective novel coming out. I would read that. They do. They do fingerprint babies for those fat little handprint things, don't they? Well, I mean, they're not fingerprinting them. Are they it's... though? <laughs> are they on the system? Now? Have you unlocked a conspiracy right now? <laughs> There must be a subreddit about this exact thing. Oh, there is. I mean, people think the world's flat, so there are definitely people who think babies are being fingerprinted. And babies are flat also, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're just, we're going deep Rolling them out. Now. Rolling them out. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, Mary Lee is very, very upset that she's being sent away. Madrigal, it turns out, is not that upset that they're being separated, which is no. a, a bit of a knife to Mary Lee's heart. Um, Mary Lee, in in the spirit of the melodrama that encompasses the entire book, says, if you send one of us away, we won't be whole. Well, that's the other thing. Did you feel like, I actually noted down later some of the dialogue, because I feel like everybody talks like they're in a Victorian novel all yeah. the time. It's not just the mother and father thing, it's everything. Yeah, there are no um, contractions and things like that. No, they all have this kind of lofty way of speaking. It's really weird. I feel like this whole book is just an exercise in surrealism. Maybe that's how everyone speaks at boarding school. I don't know, I never went. I don't know, and this is a very posh boarding school, which we'll get into. That's miles away, because she has to fly. 
Yeah. Think of the a thousand expense. miles, she said. A thousand miles. A thousand nine hundred. Oh, yeah. Nine hundred. Whatever it was. Line. Pretty specific for no reason at all. <laughs> um, so she flies away to this. Um, just imagine the expense of bringing her home every holiday. Yeah. Even that's quite a lot. But they're quite well off. They're they? obviously very rich, so. Yeah. Um, so she goes off to, uh, I could not want to say college. It's not college. It's just high school. Mm-hmm. But it feels like college. And she's put in with roommates Bianca and Mindy. Two of the most 90s names. <sighs> yeah. I think. And like quite posh names as well. I've only ever known one Bianca and she wasn't that nice. Oh. Mary Lee really struggles with being at this new school. And she says something that I relate to quite a lot. She said she was an event when she was yeah. with her sister. And now she's a non-event. And I have to say, I felt like this going from school to college to uni. Because I was like, as I assume you were, quite like a high achiever. I thought you were going to say weird kid. <laughs> which I was going to be like, how dare you, but also yes. Yes, true. <laughs> um, and I found school quite easy. College, but less so. Mm. And university incredibly hard. So I went from being like, oh yeah, this is fine and everyone knows me. To being like a slightly dumber fish in a bigger pond yeah. and then like a stupid fish <laughs> in an incredibly large ocean so then I was like oh shit yeah because at school you're the smart kid and then mm. you go to uni where everyone was the smart kid and you're like hey I'm really not the smart kid anymore turns out not so clever yeah <laughs> turns out you have to work hard at this life thing <laughs> it's unfair <rubbish. laughs> um so yeah she um she comes home to visit as well and she expects a grand reunion but Madrigal has moved on and has got a boyfriend, John Pear. Oh, fuck it. I can't believe we're skipping straight on to John Pear. There's so much nonsense before oh. then. There's so much. <laughs> like, I can't believe we haven't even delved into this school. Because she says... <laughs> you know, Mary Lee, quote, You even share the same ski slope with the boys' school. The same ski slope. The same ski slope. Then they must fuck... But also, what, do, the, do schools normally have separate ski slopes? I didn't have a fucking ski slope at my school. What the hell? <laughs> this, oh my god. I think I've just glossed over it because I'm like, well, Rich. But come on, a ski slope. Is it in the mountains? It must be in the mountains. Well, though. I mean, maybe, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a separate ski slope just for the schools then. A private ski slope. I can't get over this. <laughs> it's incredible. I'm just imagining it as... Um, I don't know what I'm imagining now. I just, <laughs> that's, that is quite bizarre now you bring it up. And also the gendering. Like, if you go near boys on a ski slope, you will fuck. Yeah. That's, we, we must keep them apart. I don't know. Yeah, like that's the only time they ever come across each other is on the ski slope. It is quite a strange school. But again, I think I've just put that down to it being rich people. And also it being down to all Caroline B. Cooney's books are Mad. that shit. Yeah, because yeah, it's even things like later, of course, one of the characters sings in a madrigal choir. She's like, well, I've sang in madrigal choirs since I was a child. And you're like, of course you fucking have. Of course you have. Of and course you, you have. Probably play the cello. <sighs> yeah. All the rich people. I don't know why cello was Speak my... Latin. Yeah. Oh, see, I know someone who does speak Latin. I feel like you can do you can do one of these things. You can't so when do I, No, you can't. When I was a kid, we used to go skiing, not on a private ski slope and not on a ski slope that was part of my school. It was a kind of big activity park that was near our house that had like a cinema and a bowling alley and a dry ski slope. It wasn't a proper ski slope. Um, so I did go skiing, but I didn't do Madrigal Choir and I didn't do Latin. <laughs> I feel like you're allowed one thing you're not allowed all of them yeah i feel like i went there was a dry ski slope in sheffield which might be one of the saddest phrases of all time <laughs> <laughs> and then when i got older <laughs> they built uh, like a fake snow slope oh yeah in uh doncaster uh not doncaster wickfield which is quite exciting but yeah, even that was kind of an event, you know? Like, oh, we're going to escape. Mm. Yeah, why are they always called escape? That word hurts same, my same brain. Company. Yeah, I know, because it doesn't really... Yeah, I know exactly your issue with that. Um, anyway, yeah, anyway, so well, let's go into John, John Pear. And I should clarify, the fruit, not the two things. No. <laughs> P-E-A-R. So 
A R. A J O N. J O N, no H. Mm -hmm. That's very American, John isn't it? And they always call him John Pair. John Pair. She even says, Oh, as a man, you have to say both names. And I do feel like that about quite a lot of people. Even my partner, I'll often use both names. Yeah, I do that. I do that to my wife, actually. Annie Bennett, what do you want for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> do you like these curtains, Annie Bennett? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, but no, you don't do it all the time. Also, John Pear. I feel like you could say just Pear, even. JP? No. Oh, I know. He, mm. He's not a JP, though. No, he's a dickhead. <laughs> no, he is, yeah. Tell me about John Pear. I'm so excited. Oh, my word. Um... So John Pear, weirdly, is described as so handsome, but also not handsome, like in the same sentence. Um, so here we go. Create... This mental picture of sexy, sexy John Pear. So he's got yellow eyes with vertical pupils. He wears a silk vest. <laughs> um, also, he winks at her and his wink is sickeningly violent yet completely sexy. Can we try that? <laughs> Go on, give me a... I want... <laughs> <laughs> like an angry pirate. No, but I feel like that was sickeningly violent. <laughs> now do one that's completely sexy. Oh, there because it's a slow wink as well. A <laughs> slow wink. There's there's a real fine line where you can just tip over into having a stroke. Yeah, because here we go. This one, that's what I look like. Here's my slow wink. <laughs> <laughs> do you need some medical assistance? It's not. It's, it's not, not right. It's so number one, we can't even do a slow wink that doesn't look like you're having a little facial tick. Which, you know, I get a little tingle in my eye sometimes so when I'm stressed, same. right? So it's like that. So we can't do it even one or the other. We can't do it violent or sexy. I can't understand how you would have a violent wink. <laughs> Unless you were winking while stabbing someone or something like that. Or like you've got a bomb detonator on your lower eyelid and when you wink... It sets the bomb off. It was a sickeningly violent wink. Exactly. Because it started World War Three. Exactly, because it destroyed, <laughs> literally destroyed a building. So yeah, that's what we've got for John Pear. He also does this weird thing, which I have to do. So when he meets Mary Lee, he dots her cheek vertically with the tip of his fingers. What? Do you just stab someone that. with it, your hand? Dot it. Like the, Why? I don't know. It's not it's erotic, weird. is it? I don't understand what it's meant to be. He also... This is my favourite part. John Pear, yellow eyes, silk vest, sickeningly sexy wink. He eats her tears. Yeah. He eats them. Okay, we've jumped ahead. We have. Okay, okay. Okay, so, yeah, let's cool, okay. so we've let's only had a mention of John Pear. Yes, but, so... But it becomes more complicated. Let's Let's jump back. That's our intro to John Pear. Yes. But then. And do remember slippery silk vest. Vest. Oh, oh my silk word. Silk vest. I, I imagine it like a Rab C. Nesbitt vest. Oh, no. Made out of silk. So it's just sort of in. erotically nipple hair. Ugh, it's poking God. through. Horrible. I just, I imagine it as like really 90s. Do you remember in the 90s and guys wore those, it was like silk waistcoats with like kind of stained glass type patterns on them? Uh, no, what? Oh, maybe what? Maybe that's where I lived. <laughs> Like, is this a Glasgow thing? Not stained, I don't know how to describe it. Not quite paisley, but just like multicoloured shit. Not quite paisley is our uh, t-shirt phrase of the episode. Not quite paisley. <laughs> not quite paisley. Yeah. It's not LA, but it's not quite paisley. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Mary Lee doesn't meet John Pear when she first goes home because Madrigal doesn't want them to meet. Madrigal mm. doesn't really want to lose any of her pull over John Pear. Which, fair enough. I think I would be kind of like, no, you're not me and my boyfriend because we look exactly the same. You know? Do you think? Well, yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe I'm not that much of a neurotic freak. Well, um, I mean, fair enough to be insecure. They are 16. Yeah, very true. So, um, Mary Lee ends up going back to boarding school. And she's really upset. And she doesn't really know who she is. And she can't really make friends with anyone else. And she's very, very lonely. And I asked um, my partner, David, about this. David is... Um, his twin brother is called James. And when they went away to university, they went to different unis. And he said he really um, felt dislocated. Like, really, really dislocated and upset and didn't know who he was. And both the boys actually ended up suffering from depression oh. at uni. 
So I thought, is Caroline B. Cooney a twin? I mean, she's obsessed with twins because in the perfume, Dove and Wing are, are twins. A, a disapp- one's a disappeared twin. Yeah, so I wonder if she either is a twin or, or had, has twins, because she's yeah. got three kids, it says in her bio, so I wonder if what if they're twins, or oh. two of them are twins, or maybe she just really wanted twins, or yeah. I don't know. She's clearly got an obsession with them, though. Yeah, I was, but I thought she she did it really well, apparently, if, if we were twins, perhaps mm. we would understand. Uh, side note, my landlady has triplets, and two are identical twins, and one isn't. <gasps> I don't... Wow. really understand how that has occurred. I think that's very unusual, but I would imagine how that happens is that two eggs would have got fertilised, one split and one didn't. That seems really rare. Yeah. Fascinating. Very rare, you would think. So, Mary Lee is at school, feeling dislocated and like she doesn't really know who she is, and then she gets a letter out of the blue telling her that Madrigal is coming to visit. Despite their parents' protestations. Mm. Plot point. Which we don't really know yet. No. Why her parents are so determined that they don't see each other. Yeah. Um, so she immediately thinks that they're going to have this beautiful reunion. And they kind of do. Like, Madrigal shows up. And I don't think she's a bad person, but she's just so charming. Yeah. <laughs> that all of... Obnoxiously charming. <laughs> all of Mary Lee's classmates fall in love with Madrigal. Um... What do you think about that bit? I don't think she's being mean. I think she's just naturally quite charming. It's like uh, Kate in Teacher's Pet. She so... can't help that she's so beautiful. <laughs> she just can't help that she's so charming. I mean, she doesn't seem like she does it on purpose because it's not her fault that Mary Lee... Has a bit of, of a wet blanket. Yeah, and hmm. was a bit... Well, maybe, was she depressed? It doesn't label it as such, but she certainly was not happy. She was school. isolated. Yeah. Um, not, not a lot of fun, really. In what might be a feminist point, but I might be reaching a little bit too much, um, she merrily says to herself that she realises it's not all about looks. Mm-hmm. And that, in fact, the reason they like Madrigal is because she's got a personality, because mm-hmm. they share the same face. But it's not all about the face, otherwise she would be that popular as well. It's that Madrigal is confident and funny and charming. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ooh, is that, is that a sneaky, hidden feminist point there? I don't so think it's, it's not all about looks. Or I just think that's true of I think that's something that we all realize as teenagers that it's not as simple as that and I think you can meet someone and think that they're not particularly good looking but then when you get to know them Mm. if they're really kind really interesting really um fun to be around they become a lot more attractive looking whereas if you meet someone who's really good looking and then they're shallow and petty and bitter then they become really ugly yeah or they just they literally just don't look as nice, yeah. even though the face is the same. They look sort of gnarled and twisted. Exactly, because you can see the kind of bitterness and the nastiness inside them. Whereas I think when someone, yeah, they maybe if you saw a photo of them, you wouldn't think that they were particularly beautiful. If you know that they're a beautiful person, they become yeah. so beautiful to you and so attractive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just realised I've stepped, <laughs> skipped over this amazing bit where. Um, Mary Lee didn't tell anyone that she had a twin at boarding school because her parents told her not to. So then when she starts telling them that her identical twin is coming to visit, one of the girls says, it happens at at this time of year. Too much winter. The useless ones get crazy. They start believing in identical twins. That's very (laughs) How common could that be? (laughs) No, it always happens when it's January. Everyone starts twin identical twin. Twin twin sanity. Ah! We have pretty harsh winters here in Scotland, but I've never, I've never started believing told people I, I was a twin, an identical twin. Although people do confuse me for you quite a lot. Yeah, and we really don't look alike. No, and it's really depressing for me because you're much more successful. So people go, "Are you Kirsty Logan?" And I have to go, "No, I'm sorry." <laughs> but then I think you should say <laughs> shitty things and say, you should say like, "Yes, I am Kirsty Logan, and I love Hitler." Yeah, I am Kirsty Logan, and what do you think you're doing talking to How me? How dare you look me in the eye? <laughs> Eyes on the ground. <laughs> Just go and kick a puppy. Oh no, I couldn't do yeah. it. Yeah, no. but that's gonna flip at some point. People will be like, "Oh my god, are you Heather Perry?" And I'll be like, "No, I'm sorry." And you'll be like, "What's the line, Hitler, Hitler, Hitler?" <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, because I've already got a plan. I'm ready. Oh no. Yep. Oh no, that's gonna ruin me. Yep. <laughs> so. Back to the boarding yes. school. Uh, Madrigal has charmed all of Mary Lee's friends, and Mary Lee is feeling even worse than ever before. She, she thought she was going to get this grand reunion with her sister, um, and it's being undermined. And Madrigal... Oh, sorry, we, I can't believe I've not mentioned this yet. They go skiing, and Madrigal is wearing Madrigal. this. Jacket and pants looked as if they had begun life as a taffeta Christmas ball gown. 
darkly striking crimson and green plaid with black velvet trim and black boots. Madrigal was no oddity, but a trendsetter. And later it's described as sparkling, so it's a glittery taffeta tartan ski suit. Taffeta tartan. I yeah. Those words have never appeared together before. <laughs> well, I mean, the 90s weren't great for fashion, is that, let's be honest. Is that the height of fashion in 1994? I mean, you could see something like that in Clueless, mm. the film, surely. Velvet. Stuff like that. Velvet trim is stupid on a ski slope. It'll just remain wet. Oh, yeah. I don't... Anyway... Everyone's stunned yeah. by this skiing outfit to the extent that it's like borderline sexual obsession with it for yeah. everyone. Very not, not even Madrigal, the ski suit. Yeah, the ski suit and how amazing she looks in it. Um, so Madrigal, in what appears to be a moment of um, generosity, says to Mary Lee, tomorrow you put on this hideous ski suit and go out as Madrigal and then you can be me and everyone will react to you as if you're Madrigal and they will like you, and you'll be popular. And then when we tell them we switched, it'll be like a reset button for you because you'll be more interesting, and you'll be more uh, funny, and people mm-hmm. will give you a more of a chance than they did before. Which is really nice. I thought so as well, and sort of continue to think so. Yeah. Despite some of the lies peddled later on in the book. Yeah, because that's interesting. Yeah, we don't really. Our opinion of magical changes, but then maybe it shouldn't. But we can get into that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's all going fine, and they do it, and Mary Lee is Madrigal, and Madrigal is Mary Lee, and um, Madrigal is so popular that all the people are around her, yeah. and Mary Lee, Madrigal... Even though Madrigal doesn't actually say anything, if you notice the scene, she doesn't say anything to anyone, all she does is appear in her sparkly tartan, and they're all like, oh my god, Madrigal, you're so you're the best. cool, you're so funny, you're so witty, but she, hasn't, she doesn't say anything. That's a very good point. And then Madrigal, as Mary Lee... Um, sort of is left to go on her own and she goes up onto the, um, what's it called? Ski lift. The ski lift. And in some sort of accident that I can't quite understand... It's not the best description. No. Uh, she falls to her death. Mm-hmm. And I will say, um, I thought the, the description of the fall actually is really good. Mm-hmm. I'll read that out to you. Um, her twin's body spiralled only once and then, head first, fell prisoner to gravity. Not on soft snow, not neatly feet first, not easily into cushioning hands, but viciously, cruelly, horribly onto the rock scree which divided the bunny slope from the advanced. The end of identical twins took only a moment. The mountain had no respect for their twinship. The rocks had not cared. Gravity had not given it a second thought. Mm, now, that is good, I That's think. really yeah. good. And really speaks to that sort of horror... And, like, immediate acceptance of a severing of another part of you. Mm. I think Caroline B. Cooney's a really good writer masquerading as a terrible one. I think so, and I feel like her thing, like, the patterns of her books that we've seen so far, and we're going to look at more of her books in the future, and I think we can see if they follow this pattern. They're all about teenage girls' inner lives, and they're about mental health, and they kind of explore mental health through metaphors. So yeah. it kind of externalises certain aspects of mental health, which I think is really interesting because, I mean, let's be honest, most other point horror books do not go below the surface of anybody's inner life or psychology (laughs) at all. So I I do feel like she's got a lot more psychological insight than most of the other writers. And takes more chances. Mm -hmm. And talks about identity quite a lot. Girls and identity and what it is to be um, a young teenage woman. Mm -hmm. Young teenage woman? Is that a phrase? Yeah, sure. Why not? To be a YA. Um... So, obviously, she's dead, which I was quite surprised about as well. I, didn't, mm. I thought, well, oh, surely they won't just kill her off. Oh, they, oh, they have. <laughs> they have, quite yeah. so early in the book as well. Um, so Mary Lee goes into shock, and people keep saying, oh, Mary Lee's dead. Or people keep uh, referring to her as Madrigal, and she keeps saying, Mary Lee. Mm-hmm. But they just think she's in such shock that she just keeps saying her dead twin like sister's name. crying out for her. Yeah, Mary mm-hmm. Lee. Yeah. Mary Lee. Um, yeah. And then they tranquilise her, which mm-hmm. I thought was a bit harsh give her a I mean I guess they would if you were kind of panicking I don't really know yeah if you were I've never been tranquilized (laughs) what would you have to do I mean it sounds nice (laughs) I mean not I can arrange this for you not when you're just kind of walking down the street but you know if you're upset it'd be quite nice (laughs) now I can just imagine you being shot with a tranquilizer dart (laughs) 
<laughs> as you sort of angrily move from a space that's annoyed you. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I wish I, I wish I was tranquilized right now. And Annie just shoots you with a gun. Boom. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It wouldn't be a boom. It'd be more like, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I felt that was quite good. Oh, that was good. Yeah. And then it would be like... my the, experience. The, like, tufty. The tufty end. Oh, would yeah. Be sticking out. Like, yeah. And, where have I seen that? Must have been in a film. When they've shot an elephant or something. God, I haven't been hunting, so... <laughs> must have like been in a film. Neither have I. No. Um, and then, okay, so her parents show up, and they're like, oh my god, she's dead. Um, and her dad says, like, oh, did you see it? Did she scream out? <clears throat> I've actually written down what he says. Precisely what he says. What is wrong with him? He says... <laughs> this is his exact response. Was it terrible? Was it quick? Did she cry out? You're like, mate, what is wrong with you? Oh, well, like he's, that's a real stab in the guts, isn't Fucking it? Fucking hell. Oh, did you see your identical twin sister die? Did she Was it awful? Out? Did she suffer? That's your what kid that you're talking about. Ask somebody else. Lots of people saw it. Don't ask her. <laughs> but he's weird because also I noted down what he said um, when she's going off to this boarding school. This is what he says. He says, try hard, make friends, stay alive. Yeah. You're like, Christ, mate. <laughs> Dial it back. No wonder she's so melodramatic. <laughs> Her parents are off the charts. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it's just... Stay alive. Just stay alive. You know, they might say, be safe or be careful. Yeah, but not stay, stay alive. alive. As if it's it's likely that she won't. Well, you know, famously at boarding school, people just die. <laughs> it's just like a battle royale. Every boarding school has battle royale. Oh, I would love... I love that movie. <laughs> And the book. Yeah. I haven't read the book, actually. I saw oh. the film, watched it again quite recently. The book is very good. Um, so her parents show up, and she's sort of caught in this lie of being madrigal, because she keeps trying to confess, but people won't really listen to her. And she thinks, oh, my parents will know. Mm. And then her parents don't. Well, also, she kind of doesn't want to, because she's so convinced that everyone... Hates really, her. Yeah, hates her and really likes madrigal. So she sort of... She also mentions, like, oh, well, if I stay as Madrigal, it's a way to keep her alive. Which I thought was a nice note on grief. Yeah, it's you quite know, sad, isn't really, it? I, mm. A lot of this is quite sad, really. Mm. Maybe I'm just into the melodrama. I mean, it is very melodramatic, but when, when the melodrama eases off slightly, I feel like there is some genuine emotion going on there. Yeah, true. So, um, obviously, thinking she's Madrigal, her parents take her home. Um, and then f- immediately force her to go to school. Mm. Which, Isabel, give her a week off. Anything. A month. Give her some she travel license. Of, doesn't she have a bit of time? Because she's she's like in a daze and she's like, the days became nights and the nights became days oh, or something true. like that. So I guess I just that thought suggests like a week. Time. Yeah, maybe it is a week. Yeah. I just know. a bit, you know, push her back into a school. I mean, I don't think that we think these are particularly good parents. No. I don't no. think they make good choices. Um, no, none of the parents in Point Horror are good. Ever. No. They're, no. Anyway. Them. So, Madrigal who is, well, Mary Lee as Madrigal, um, then has to go to Madrigal school, of course, and she knows she's going to meet John Pear, and she knows she's going to meet all Madrigal's friends. Um, so and I, she's, I was too hasty in describing John Pear, because at this point she still assumes... Has never met him. Yeah, she hasn't met him, and she still assumes that he's, like, a lovely, nice boy. And John Pear, if you said to me, what does that character look like, I would say they're quite round. Round with kind of sandy blonde hair. Round bottomed, yeah, very like fruity. Maybe, sort of maybe guy. green. <laughs> yeah, maybe green. Maybe he grows on trees. Maybe, 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 um, maybe he's he's always slightly riper than you think he is. Yeah, <laughs> this is amazing because the pears in that fruit bowl are massively overripe, oh, and it's just making me feel quite weird. Yeah. Um, is he, should we call them John Pear? John Pear. John Pear. A, oh God! A bucket of John Pear. <laughs> <laughs> it's the plural of pear. Now pear. No, I don't know why a I said that. bucket of John Pear. It sounded weird when I said it. Would you I like just any one like of these John Pear? Each individual pair is called John Pear. John Pear. So they're, they're a pair of John Pear. If yes. you get to. John oh, Pear. Satisfying. We're making that sound quite French. <laughs> Jean, Jean Pear. Pear. Jean Pear. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so Mary Lee as Madrigal ends up at Madrigal School. And everyone is kind of terrified of her. Mm-hmm. Including the principal. And I think this is really strange. Um... I'm going to read it to you. Actually, it's good that he says a stupid thing. He says, It's an unusual situation, and none of us can possibly understand the depth of your emotions. I just want to know that we understand. 
which I thought is good because it is the kind of stupid thing people say when you've lost someone. You know, mm. when they're just sort of like, oh, well, you know, they're an angel in heaven now. Or yeah. like, and you're like, shut up. He's a bit dead. kind of bumbling. Like, I imagine that he looks like the fat controller from Thomas <laughs> the Tank. Yes. Yes. He just kind of like bumbles around, not really knowing what he's doing, which, I mean, I've got to say, a lot of grown ups are like that. They are, yeah. Speaking as a grown up. And then. <laughs> Ma- uh, Madrigal, Mary Lee as Madrigal, mm-hmm. completely points this out, which she would never have done before. She says, you can hardly do both. Either you understand or you do not. And in this case, you do not. Which I think is a really brutal thing to say to a yeah. teacher. Um, and he is afraid of her. And in fact, his smile scre- stretched in a queer oval. Oh, <laughs> that's my drag queen name. Queer oval. Queer oval. <laughs> I really loved it. Like a rubber, rubber band around spread fingers. And then get this weird bit. Walk me to my class, she commanded. He moved like a good little boy and walked nervously ahead, turning twice to be sure she was still there. The creases in his charcoal suit wrinkled with each knee bend. Oh. No. I like that description. That's very kinky, isn't it? The creases in his suit's kinky. No, that he's sort of like a good little boy. Oh, yeah. He walks like a good little boy and she's commanded him. I wouldn't have read it as kinky. But I can see why you do. <laughs> <laughs> I am... Oh, for me, it's just like... She's a teenager. Why then, is... And, and he's like groveling in front of her. But do you not remember as a teenager reaching that... So, you, you know, as a kid, you look up to adults and you think adults know things and you kind of do what they say generally because you feel like they know what they're talking about. Do you not remember reaching a point as a teenager and it was quite a shocking point that you were like, oh god, they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know any better than I do, really. And I don't know, maybe I was just a nasty bitch when I was a teenager, but I remember reaching a point of kind of disdain for a lot of the adults around me because I could see, I wanted them to be these kind of perfect, smart, strong people, I guess, because I hoped that that's what I would be when I was older. But I remember learning about some of my teacher's various personal problems and being quite, to be honest, I think at the time I was scared of Mm -hmm. that because I thought, well, if they can't handle life, what fucking chance have I got? But at the time it came across as like feeling disdain towards them or thinking, you haven't got your shit together, why are you telling me what to do? You see, I think by about age 10, I thought I knew everything. (laughs) Much more than all adults and other children. You sound like the worst child. Oh, I was terrible. I was really, really awful. Um, anyway, so it's weirdly, she's got this weirdly kinky hold over her principal. Um, he seems into it, though. He does kind of seem into Ugh. it. But everyone just accepts that she's Madrigal, which I suppose you would. Um, now, what she's... I mean, even if you suspected, you wouldn't mention it, would you? No. Like, if David came home and you were like, David's acting weird, you wouldn't suddenly be like, you're not David. Are you... James. Yeah, yeah. Would, you just wouldn't think that, would you? Or would you? I don't know. They've been they've done stranger things. <laughs> <laughs> My um we all used to live in uh Latin America together and James moved out there before the rest of us and then I moved out there and then David moved out there and I'm sure James won't mind me saying this, but he was a wreck of a human when David showed up and David had been uh, doing crossfit and tanning on the south coast where he lived and swimming in the sea for two hours every day so he was incredibly buff and tanned and good looking and I remember when um, J- David walked into the room and I just thought oh James oh, oh no. poor you but um, I would hate that if there was someone that looked exactly like me but way better I would <laughs> no, hate that in that moment I thought thank god I haven't got an identical yeah. twin because that must be <laughs> awful it's like seeing the your own attic portrait yeah it's like oh god terrible but even then when they look so different because James had not told a lot of people there that he had an identical twin people would come up to David and just start having conversations as if he was James. Like, James, you look amazing. They're like, you look Aww. really great. Or like, hey, just carrying on a conversation they had before. And David would have to go, no, sorry, I'm not James. And they would go, what? Like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, if you hadn't told me that there was an identical Kirsty Logan, let's that call her weird. Kirsten. Oh no, yeah. that's a terrible name for Kirsten Logan. Christy Logan. Christy Logan. Who apparently, I get all the emails for Christy <laughs> Logan. So. I get emails for someone called Heather Perry. I don't know oh, who wow. she is. <laughs> literally there in my email address just look at right above oh, no. anyway 
And then if I saw someone who looked like you in the street and then they were kind of weird and said, no, I'm, I'm not Kirsty, I'm, I'm Christy Logan, I'd think, well, Kirsty's being a bitch today. I know, what's wrong with her? <laughs> Just tell me you don't want to chat. That happened to me at uni. Not that I've got a twin, but there was another girl on the campus who looked so much like me. I never saw her. Lots of people told me about her. She looked a lot like me. She dressed in a similar way to me as well, to the point that quite a few people would go past and be like, hi, Kirsty. And then she would just look at them like, <laughs> what the hell? And then later people would say to me, why did you ignore me? And I was like, well, I've been home this weekend. What are you talking about? That's so, so yeah, strange. It's weird. I think a lot of people have doppelgangers. Yeah. Mm. But I think also a lot of times people don't look at your actual face. So like us getting mistaken for each other it's just because although my hair is different now in my author picture I've got a red pixie cut which is what you've got mm -hmm. so I think people they're not really looking at the face they're just like oh red pixie cut I've seen that yeah you pale know? pale woman yeah red pixie cut yeah they're what they must be the identical person exactly but I mean I do that as well like our downstairs neighbor um he's like a standard hipster guy he's got the like shaved sides long on top hair or longer on top hair he's got bunch of tattoos beard that's what he looks like i realize i've never actually looked at his face like he's just like i just see the hair i see the beard i see the tattoos and if we see a hipstery guy on the street near our house i'm just like oh hey and then annie's like you don't know him <laughs> why is he that like, before you that's <laughs> not that's not gregor that's not our neighbor and i'm like oh fuck i thought it was because uh, he's got not a very kind of distinctive it's not ugly or handsome he's just got like standard face yeah has he got quite the thick beard yeah like a I think really it big it, thick beard it makes it really quite difficult then because you've only you've just only got, got a little bit the, of face yeah yeah it's like a, they've got a visor on and you can only see that bit mm -hmm. in my mind so I'm, I'm with you on that one yeah anyway so i don't know maybe maybe it's a different guy every time maybe this is a massive performance art project to see how many people notice yeah <laughs> <laughs> hashtag not all straight white hipster men exactly <laughs> um so uh my, mary Lee as madrigal is in her class and everyone just completely accepts that she's Madrigal. And as such, treats her just as they would treat Madrigal. So Van, who Mary Lee went on a date with once, and who mm -hmm. she quite fancies, hates Madrigal. It's for some reason to do with his sister Scarlet. Mm -hmm. So Madrigal tries to be nice to Scarlet, and Van keeps saying, not after that night. Mm -hmm. And sort of shimmies away from him, keeps everyone away from Madrigal. And then we meet John Pear. Oh yeah. I have to say, there's a bit of description about Van that I really like. I have to say, most of the description in this, I've got some bits where I'm like, oof, that's a bit too far. But there's a bit of description in this I really like, and I feel like, I loved this book when I was a kid, and I can see how it's really influenced my writing, because she describes Van. She says, he was the boy next door, he was the birthday cake and the soft icing, he was the summer wind and the new leaf. It's a bit flowery. But I think that's good to say yeah. someone is the birthday cake and the soft um, icing. Yeah. I think that's really sweet. That is quite sweet. I think that's nice writing. I have to say, having gone through so many Point Horror books of late, I do keep seeing bits of you in there. I know, complete. it's, it's creepy, like, isn't it? Oh, yeah, Kirsty's written a story with those velvet curtains in there. I know. Kirsty's described someone like that before. Wow, what's my version of that then? I don't know. I get that sometimes I read back over a book that I read maybe 10 years ago and I think, oh my god, I stole Plagiarized that. Like this, this tiny yeah. bit of description or like a, 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 like a small action that a character does and I'm like, oh my god, I did that. And you don't mean to. It just it filters through yeah. your subconscious, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, I think there's a very interesting Jungian book about this, but mm. I'm not going to attempt to say any more about that. Anyway, yeah, maybe one day I'll do a big thesis about how Point Horror has influenced me. <laughs> <laughs> After you've won all the awards. Yeah, yeah. After you've won the booker. One day. In um, 50 years, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so she meets John Pear, who makes her cry and then catches her tear and puts it in a vial. And then... Sorry, a vial he keeps around his neck. And then eats her tear. Drinks? Drinks mm, her weirdly, tear. Well, it says he eats it, by. I mean... I don't know. Just, you drink puts that. it in his mouth. Anyway, my note for this was just fucking goths. <laughs> I know. It's so goth. I'm sure when I first read this as a goth teenager, a wannabe goth teenager, I would have thought that was the coolest. And then you went around licking everyone's tears off Ooh, their face. I don't think I went that far. I mean, so did you see strange. the kids I was at school with? No. Oh, you don't right. want to have any of their bodily fluids. Don't touch them. No. Um, but as you have described, she's sort of... Not described as handsome, but as rough-looking and manly. And she... I relate to that. 
Mm. I relate to finding men attractive and not because they're particularly pretty, but because they're sort of rough and masculine looking. I realise my current partner does not fit the same. opposite. <laughs> very pretty. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a good bit of reading into teenage girl psyche. Like, oh, it looks like a man. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That was the kind of guys I liked when I was a teenager. Kind of like big. But I Burly. preferred like a big kind of bear-like, viking-y type guy. Yeah. You'd be a great gay man. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely be a bear. A hunter? <laughs> bear? Is that what you call it? A bear hunter? Or are you a bear? Like bears. Yeah. I would like bears. What's the name? For, there's probably a name to it. I'm sure there is. Um, although, I don't know whether that can be said of um, Mary Lee as Madrigal, because re- let me read this section mm. to you. She looked into the crowd where she saw Scarlet. Pretty, sweet Scarlet. Who needs a boyfriend? Especially this one. I want a girlfriend. A girl to talk to and weep with and gossip with, and know me to the bone. Is that the blandly gayest thing you've ever read in Point Horror? It is. It's kind of like, I really would like to be a lesbian, because then I can just go out with my best friend, and we can cuddle, and we can share clothes. And you're like, hmm, kinda. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean... You still have to do the kissing and fucking... a bit more than that. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, it really jumped out at me. I was like, oh, she's a wannabe bisexual girl. Maybe, but mm. Mm, I don't know. I, she's more like a Katy Perry bisexual. Do you reckon? Mm, I don't know if she's really into it. She doesn't, like, fancy any girls. True. She, she just she doesn't, doesn't want to go John out with Pair. the sickeningly violent John Pear. Yes, yeah, sickeningly which I'm like, violent just with, you, w- with his winks. Yeah, <laughs> just because you don't want to go out with a guy who wears a silk vest and winks it doesn't mean you're necessarily queer you may be but I don't isn't know that's that how we all ended up here <laughs> i don't want to date that awful guy that so i must i must be guy. a queer yeah yeah maybe uh, have you got a bit that you're desperate to read out to us yeah i mean i find him really disturbing because i think she does she's afraid of him but she also is attracted to him mm. which at the time i was like oh caroline b cooney what are you doing don't, because I'm sure as a teenager I read this and I was like, hmm, that sounds great. The guy that you're a bit afraid of, but he's still sexy. I'm yeah. so into that. Because I feel like also a lot of the media that we were consuming in the 90s had that narrative of like yeah. sexy bad boy hmm. and that that was what was meant to be attractive. And I think a lot of point horrors do that like constantly. And this comes up in some of the other books that we've looked at is if you think a guy might murder you, he becomes more attractive. And you're like, yeah. eee. Ooh, I don't know about that. saying that? But she does come to figure out his shit, to be fair. So a bit later, quite near the end of the book, um, she says, um, John Pear, you're ordinary. You're just mean and low. You're just ugly and pointless. The world has lots of people like you. I love that bit. Yeah, and that kind of destroys him, doesn't it? It's mm-hmm. like... He, he wants her to be afraid of him and he wants to be this kind of big, bad serial killer. And um, as soon as she says, actually, you're not that bad. And I think that's really interesting. And I listen to a lot of um, true crime podcasts and um, some of them, I don't like the way that they talk about kind of serial killers or violent men because, you know, we give them all these nicknames like the Night Stalker or things or Jack the Ripper, you know, that makes them sound like they're like almost like superheroes or kind of characters out of comic books and I think it makes them be these kind of held up as something special something not quite human whereas a lot of the other podcasts which I think are much better they just say no these are just like just gross awful guys they're just horrible guys that pick on people who have are defenseless in various ways because you don't pick on someone who's the same size as you or who can fight you yeah and if you do want to kill someone who's as strong as you, they have to disable them in some way, they have to drug them or, you know, do something to them, break their leg or something. So, they're actually, they're just these pathetic losers. Sad, lonely, yeah, powerless and, men. Like, I worry about that, because I, I like true crime, but then I'm like, am I part of the problem? Because I'm, like, reading about them as if they're something special, when actually they're just gross. I mean, and they've they're... killed people, and that's not okay, obviously. <laughs> I think it's interesting. Mm. But you do have to... Make sure you don't turn him into like a cult leader style style status. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good point, and we see that in John Pear, and that the pleasure he takes is in making people feel scared, even when he can't make them feel scared on his own. He has to put them into a powerless position because yes. he doesn't really have much power. So, 
Um, we sort of find out why everyone um, hates Madrigal. And it's that they were so... They're, they're the intense goth couple, aren't they, in your yeah. school? They're the, oh my god, we're so weird. Everyone watches because we're so weird. I'm going to mm-hmm. lick each other's eyeballs and stuff. Um, and they very openly talk about their BDSM sex that they do, even though they probably only do it so that they can talk about it. And they're teenagers, yeah. so it means nothing. Yeah. Um, so, oh, I did want to say this. Um, he sort of says that he wants to be her twin now as well. He's like, mm-hmm. you're my twin in evil. And uh, <laughs> and she's not into it, is she, at this point? She's no. like, oh no, he's kind of gross and I don't really want to be this person if everyone hates me. She does say, uh, twins have to be born, twins cannot be made. Which I think is a really clever play on uh, one is not born but rather becomes a woman by Simone de Beauvoir. Oh. And I was like, Caroline B. Cooney, you're getting some hardcore existential philosophy into a point horror book. Or oh, we're just bringing that. Or oh, I'm it. bringing it. Could to be it. that. Yeah. It could be that. But I think it's too similar to be completely an accident. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, um, he's JP, as I'm going to call him from now on. Is super controlling and weird and excessive. Um, but and every attempt that she has to get away is sort of thwarted because she overhears her parents saying like, "Oh, I don't miss her." Mm-hmm. And then, oh well, if one twin died, I'm glad it was that one. Mm-hmm. Which is brutal. I, I actually thought, oh my god, I can't believe parents would say that. So every time she thinks, oh, I need to stop being Madrigal and I need to get away from him, she kind of can't because everyone is trapping her back into it. She mm. thinks everyone hated Mary Lee so much. Um, <laughs> he, said, he does say to her at some point, people are always scared when you do something they don't understand. Which made me think of this time where um, Russell Brand was talking about how he can't win a fight but he's, like, abrasive, so then people might square up to him. And then the only thing he has is being so weird that they, like, get away from him. So someone will be like, I'm going to punch you, and he'll start going, oh, yeah, yeah, you want to dance around my garden? (laughs) And And they don't know what to do. So they just sort of back away and, like, oh, God, he's a complete weirdo. Good idea. Yeah, which I thought was great. Um, And we find out that Madrigal and John Pear have been sort of going around and terrorising people in the town. And how they've been doing this is... Picking up random girls in what I definitely thought was them trying to have a three-way. Are you bringing this shit to it? <laughs> it was just like they were just picking up a random girl and he's like, well, I'll show you what kind of fun we can have. And, and I, I was suppose, like, yeah. God, this is all a bit much. Um, and they take... So they do this. So him and uh, Mary Lee as Madrigal go driving and go and pick up a random girl who's a complete idiot who just gets into the car with these two complete strangers because they say they're going to take her to a party. Yeah. Don't do that, kids. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, and instead they take her to a really rough part of town with gangs and drug dealers and rats everywhere and make her get out of the car and then lock the doors. Which, by the way, that's that's actually horrible. Brutal. Like, I think in... in I never really find point horrors scary. I can't remember if I found them scary as a teenager. I definitely don't find them scary now. But that... That's actually scary. That's horrible. It's awful. I reacted quite heavily to that as well. Mm -hmm. I thought, really awful. Um, And she's like scratching at the door, desperate to get back in. And I was Mm -hmm. like, God, can you imagine being that cruel? Like, that's really, really horrible. And then he makes Merrily as Madrigal get out of Mm -hmm. the car as well. Which I thought was a nice play on, if you're with someone because they're cruel, eventually it will turn to you. Mm. People don't, they're not horrible to other people, they're horrible to everyone. There isn't this hierarchy of niceness. Do you know what I mean? That's how you end up with a twat as a partner. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, well, he was a twat to that waitress. He's also going to then be a twat to you. That's true. I also thought it was a bit of a play on this this idea of someone who thinks he's, like, a bad guy. He thinks he's so scary. But actually, he's not actually doing anything. He's, like, getting someone else. It's like those guys that have vicious dogs. Mm. And they train the dog to be really vicious. And you're like... You're so weak that yeah. you need this dog, what this poor do? dog, to do your work for you. If someone takes your dog, what have you got then? Nothing. Nothing yeah, at nothing. all. Train another one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Take a while. Um, so he makes Madrigal get out of the car and then rats come after her in a really horrible bit. And then she tries to run up some stairs and then she falls through the rotten stairs mm. and then she thinks he's going to leave her there. And she's like, don't leave me, John Pear, don't leave me. And he doesn't. And then they all get in the car and go home. Which is quite weird. It's weird, but then I also feel like that's the moment where she thinks, fuck you, John Bear. Yeah, fuck you, and this is really out of my control. Yeah, that's true. And there's a really great line 
um, when she's outside of the car realising that he isn't going to help her and there's a rat and she says, how silent was the city? How soundless the rat? Ooh. Isn't that great? I actually really like that section because I feel like you get a sense of an actual outside world because it even says this is a place where homeless people die in mm. the streets, which I feel like shows a kind of social awareness, which I don't we believe don't I've seen in any other point horrors. Um, it, I know we talked a lot about the economics of point horrors and how no one ever seems to think about money or worry about money, but at least in this, there's a sense that there are different tiers of wealth and that wealth does affect your life, whereas yeah. in all the others, they never think about that. No, never. They never have to worry about money. No. Although in um, the <laughs> episode that we did um, about the teens of the year... Oh, God, the girlfriend. The girlfriend. One of them was a bit poorer there. Yeah, but it didn't kind of... He was a self-hating poor. <laughs> yeah, it didn't really affect anything. <laughs> um, so... This is when she's like, fuck you, I'm going to get you, John Pair. You... Although, I have to mention, right, there's this description that I've written down. <laughs> it's like, with this book, every time you're like, hmm, that's actually quite good, she lobs in this little bit that you're like, mm, fucking no. hell. So here we go. This is a description of John Pair. Quote, his golden smile filled his entire face and he swiveled his head and widened the smile even more. So it's already filled his entire face and he's widened it even more. So what, it's like gone around the back of his head. And he's swiveled it. I'm like seeing that he's not. But maybe that's on purpose. Because like he also can't possibly have yellow eyes with vertical pupils. No. So maybe he it's on purpose that like he's described he's as snake. not human. He's yeah. a snake. He's reptiles like the queen. Oh, she, yeah. she blinks sideways. You'll see it. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, David Icke. <laughs> he's my idol. Um, <laughs> I really, oh, I've got to point this out. She hates John Pair, but she says at one point there was a sort of purity to him because he's mm. so evil, which is a reference to Alien. Oh, really? Yeah, in the original Alien movie where um, the android character blows oh, up yeah. and they're talking to its milky head. Remember? And I do remember milky head. And she's like, tell us what you know. And he's like, everything you know. And uh, but I'm just going to throw out one of the best scenes in all of cinema. <laughs> he says, they go, oh my God, you admire it. And he says, I won't do the voice. He says, I admire its purity, a survivor, unclouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality. And isn't that John Pair? Yeah. Isn't it? <gasps> yes. See, we're tracing all the influences right now. Right? Yeah. I'm into Caroline B. Cooney. She mm -hmm. takes things and she makes them her own. Um, so she sort of wants to hate John Pair and wants to get back at him, but she doesn't know how to do it. And then she stops him from attacking Van. And then John Pair tells her that him and Madrigal once watched a person drown. Yeah. And his whole thing is that they don't really do anything, they just watch while it happens. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, uh, came across in Breaking Bad. Oh. I know you haven't seen it, but huge spoilers here for anyone. Stop listening. Don't spoil. Oh. I haven't seen it. Okay, well there's a bit where the main character also watches something happen. Okay. And it's a real twist in the morality of the character. Because you like you can't pretend that that's okay. Okay, I and, see. And they could have helped. And similarly, they they keep saying to themselves like, "We're not doing anything. We just didn't help him." But if you sit and you could help mm. someone and you watch someone drown, that's as bad then as you're murder. In that, yeah. Yeah. And can you imagine teenagers watching a person drown? I know. And they were like, "Hmm." And his last vision was that he knew we were there and we could have helped and we didn't. And I was like, "Jesus Christ!" I know that's pretty horrible. Ring an ambulance. Yeah. Something. Oh. Um. And then she says. You're, the brilliant bit that you read out, she, you're ordinary, you're nothing. Yeah. And then she convinces John Pair to go to Winter Sleigh Day, <laughs> uh, which I still do not understand, I mean, which is uh, some sort of festival on ice. Convenient. And then they yeah, all... Cause the, yeah, because not only is the school obviously a very... Even though it's a public school, it's apparently a very posh public school, and it's right next to a lake and a forest, and it sounds the lake is The lake is frozen over, and yeah. there's some sort of thing that's happening on this lake forest area. Um, and they go there, and all their friends are there, and there's some thin ice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to make sense of this, because it doesn't really make it's sense. It's quite weird at the end. Yeah, and then I all... I feel like, all, I've got to say, all of Caroline Bikuni's books, they fall apart a bit at the end. Yeah, The great... metaphor crumbles a little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, all the other kids are there. Van and Scarlet and everyone like that. And they are all, they round on John Pair mm. and Mary Lea's Madrigal. 
And then they, she's like, oh my god, are they going to get me? And then they let her through the circle, don't they? So they're mm. accepting her. And they've all got icicles as weapons. Which is a pretty good image. It is very good. And also, uh, that it will melt eventually, yeah, so no evidence. no evidence. Best way to kill someone, I reckon, if you've not got any pigs. Um, they, eat, you can have both. they eat bodies. You can, yeah. Because well, you, you would need, oh, yeah, you to would get need rid of the, the pigs. body. So you need both, an icicle and a pig. And you'd have to keep the pigs somewhere warm so that they weren't mm, too cold to eat the body, I reckon. That's difficult. Okay. Mm. This is why we can't murder people. This is why it's taken us so long to, to get, get rid of those bodies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then she's like, oh, you should. They're like, we're going to get you, John Pair. And she says, no, don't. You have to put into the world what you want to get back out again. Mm. Which I think, a mm, bit, bit late for that. So well, that's niceness. Yeah. Um, and then some kid falls into the thin ice, and she goes over and saves him. Mm-hmm. And then when she comes back to her circle of friends, John Pear has gone. And she thinks she sees him under the ice, but she's not sure. And they're all like, no, don't worry about it. Let's move away. So and we, then, yeah, we don't really know what's happened there. And then the book ends. <laughs> yeah. So we're led to believe that all the kids murdered John Pear. Yeah, I think so. And then put him under the ice. There was another bit that I wanted to mention, just as he's being kind of unmasked and they're approaching with the icicles. So, John Pear's laugh is described as flipping in wild peels like a frisbee. And I think we should try that. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, is that how you see it? I see it as, maybe I'm thinking of a boomerang. I'm thinking of like, But the laughs described in these books are so weird. No. We had the high tinkling laugh of Shannon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a frisbee uh-huh. of a laugh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Writing tip of the day, don't describe someone's laugh. <laughs> Just never describe it. It can't go well. So a really strange ending. But I will say that we should clear this up. She tells everyone that she's Mary Lee and they're mm-hmm. like, oh, we thought so. And then she says to her parents, I'm Mary Lee. And they were like, yeah, we know. Uh, we just didn't know how to talk to you about it. And also, when we said we wish the, we're we glad she was dead, we meant Madribel because she was evil. Which I still think is really brutal for a parent to be like, oh, I'm glad my daughter's dead. And also, we, we were talking about this earlier, that is she... Because kind of all we know about what she's done is through John Pear, and he could be lying because she doesn't do anything evil to Mary Lee. You know, I think... Because he says, oh, she only went to that to your school to kill, kill you. you. But she couldn't she doesn't possibly do anything. have known that there was a problem with the ski lift. And even if she did know, why would she then swap out Get on with it. Her? Like, it, if it's a plan, it was a terrible plan. Yeah, I didn't get that at all. I don't believe she did go there. Do you think and he's if, just saying that? Maybe. And if she did all this horrible shit, it's only because of him. Yeah. Because as we've seen, he wants, no, he wants an e- a twin and evil. Because <laughs> they don't, her parents don't really say that Madrigal was evil it was more like there's she, something wrong there's with just her. yeah and it could just be that they were too close as twins and that that's why they sent Mary Lee away to yeah. get away from Madrigal's influence and they wanted to keep Madrigal at home to sort of keep an eye on her mm-hmm. it's like a teenager getting into drugs isn't it like yeah. you wouldn't be like oh well, she's evil you'd be like well she's fallen into some bad influences mm-hmm. or what have you mm-hmm. um so yeah what a what a bizarre ending yeah a really oh, brutal ending also forgot my favorite bit of dialogue <laughs> Which, um, so when I was saying they all talk like they're in a Victorian novel, so at one point Mary Lee's trying to convince John Pear to, you know, tone, tone his shit down, and she says, this is a direct quote, This is truly bad. You have to stop being so rotten. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, okay, why are you talking like that? Imagine if a judge in a court... This is truly bad. (laughs) You have done a truly bad thing, Mr. Manson. You You have have to stop being so rotten. Oh, you rotten, Mr. Toad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, love that. Love that. There's also another description I like. I've just noted down like all the descriptions that I love. So when Mary Lee wakes up in the hospital, it's, quote, in a vanilla plain room under crispy sheets with white waffled blankets. And I was like, oh, that sounds delicious. Why is she in <laughs> so a was like an ice cream house. sundae. Mmm, yeah. <laughs> vanilla crispy waffles. Mmm. She's obsessed with food. I mean, John Pear. Yeah, that's true. Maybe she was hungry when she was writing this. <laughs> Just get a sandwich, Caroline. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any 90s things? I mean, the glittery taffeta tartan ski suit yeah. is pretty 90s. And the very concept of skiing is very 90s. Not yeah. everyone snowboards. And I also think that the concept of the very beautiful twins 
it just makes everyone think of Sweet Valley High. Like, oh, I would yeah. love that in the 90s. I think there's an Instagram account that follows our Instagram account called Sweet Valley Me. Oh. And it's all about Sweet Valley High. So, yeah, do check that out. Um, how about the fashion? I mean, I didn't see that much. It was a lot about ski suits. Yeah. There was like some white blouses and things, but it wasn't, I don't think it was that 90s really. I think you're referring to a white shirt with a lacy front. And yeah. then she also wears an ankle length black skirt and a hot pink jacket. Yeah, that's weird, it's isn't it? That's pretty 90s. The, the, the long skirt jacket. thing. The long skirt is with a jacket is quite 90s. She also at one point wears a t-shirt with a ruffled pocket and I was like, I can't picture <laughs> that at all. I don't know what that means. Again, I'm back onto my Seinfeld pirate shirt that we mentioned a few podcast episodes ago. Oh yeah, ago. like ruffles. A mm. ruffled pocket. Mm, yeah. Like I don't just put a doily in there. Yeah, just, just like flourish. one pocket with ruffle. I don't know. It's quite pirate I, I think so. Um, to, on to our top trumps. Oh, yeah. Do we have a too stupid to live heroine? No. I don't think she's stupid. I think she's melodramatic. Yeah. I don't think she's stupid, though. No, I don't think Madrigal is stupid either, and she's the one that ends up dead. Yeah. So, um, no. I don't no. think so. But then I don't think Caroline B. Cooney's books are kind of stereotypical point no. horrors. We've definitely got a sexy sociopath. Yeah, well, supposedly sexy in his slippery silk well, vest. I mean, oh. he, he is literally a sociopath, though, because at one point, or maybe a psychopath, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but at one point he talks about, he's actually talking about Madrigal, but he really means himself when he says, oh, you just see people as toys for you to play with, and mm. I know that that is one kind of characteristic of a psychopath, is that they don't have a concept of other people having in a life and in a life or being real almost ah. so maybe he actually is a sociopath maybe he's the clearest evil one so far i think yeah because usually they've just got a bit of damage but he's just like awful um yeah, although i have to say her choice if she doesn't want john pear the only other guy she fancies is van right and here's what van is like we haven't really talked about him because he's just so Bland. Vanilla, he's yeah. like a cardboard cutout. <laughs> he's vanilla with waffle blankets. <laughs> um, so he plays water polo. He wears blue blazers and khaki pants, and he's got thin blonde hair. Oh god, he sounds awful. That sounds like the least sexy man I can possibly imagine. He sounds like he's in the Hitler Youth. Oh, he so, sounds so worse. Oh no, don't Whoa. date him. Don't date him. Just thin don't... blonde hair. Be a lesbian, as you clearly want to be. Well, yeah, her female friends sound a lot. They sound great. I'm better. into Scarlet. Scarlet's a hot name as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Death Toll. Just the one. Jump Air. Jump Air. Oh well, and Madrigal, Mad- but that's an accident. Yeah. But they still end up dead. Well, okay, two then. Two, okay, two. Um, and two major characters, which is unusual. That is true. And quite early on, mm-hmm. uh, Mar- uh, Madrigal dies. Madrigal is Mary Lee. Mm-hmm. I'm confusing myself, even. <laughs> um, is it good, though? Yes. I also think so. What out of five would you give it? I mean, oh, it's tricky, because you're like, is it good, or is it just a lot? <laughs> it's like a lot of shit in this. That's a lot I like a lot. I like a lot. A lot is better than not enough. That is very true. Um, I think four. Ooh, I might give it a five. Really? I like the twin thing as well. I like it a lot. That's true. I just, I, I guess, if you read it as like an intentional surreal melodrama, five. Yeah. If you read it as like it having at least an attempt at realism, then no. no. Yeah, definitely. Not. But if we're going like, if you love surreal things and if you love melodrama if you like everything turned up to 11 then yeah five i trust caroline b cooney now to give me something um that i want yeah you know what i mean so i'm on board i'm on board uh is it good bad oh yeah (laughs) weirdly it's good and good bad but then we're seeing this a lot with caroline b cooney i feel like you can read it like as something that's fun and silly and you're going to take the piss out of but you can also read it as good you see i think i don't think it's good bad oh don't you oh well kind of it's a tricky one isn't it Uh, it is very melodramatic yeah i mm, i would give it a three for good bad and a four for good good yeah i'll go with that yeah fair enough Mm -hmm. okay um i don't know five for both is tempting also yeah (laughs) Maybe we've been desensitised by reading so much point. Maybe, maybe. Um, 
Kirsty, do you want to tell us what we'll be reading next time? Yes, next time we are going to be reading Fun House by Diane Ho. And this is also one that you can listen to on YouTube. You can listen to the dramatisation on YouTube. Well, as far as I know, they might have been taken down in the meantime, but um, it is there. So if you can't get your hands on the book, but you want to have a read along, then you can listen to A Fun House, A Whole Lot of Fun, by oh, Diane no. Oh Hope. no, you ruined that for me now. I know, it's in your head, it's in your head, sorry. Also, unfortunate name, Diane Ho. I know. Oh well. Um... Oh, great name, depending yeah. on how you feel. Um, so you can um, make sure you don't miss that episode by subscribing mm -hmm. on um, iTunes or Apple Podcasts on your phone or um, Stitcher or... Anywhere you get your podcast, really. And if you want to be super sweet and make us love you forever, then if you could give us a little rating and a review and share with your friends, we would love that. And we would love to see you doing that. That's true. Um, you can also get us on social media. Um, our Twitter is um, at Teenage Scream underscore. And our Instagram is at Teenage Scream Pod. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are feeling particularly generous and love us and would buy us a coffee if you saw us in the street... You can get us on Patreon, so you can, if you just search um, Teenage Scream Podcast on Patreon, you'll find us there. And it's linked to on all our social media as well. It is, yes. Um, and you can give us the price of a coffee or a donut or something as a little sort of thank you for making these. And help us to make more. Yeah. Fantastic. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.